Our first presenter is Louise Van Meurs. Louise has worked in the Commonwealth's agriculture portfolio for the last 25 years. Louise is currently the first Assistant Secretary in the Trade and Market Access Division of the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources. The division provides policy and strategic leadership for the department's international activities, including providing significant input into the negotiation of free trade agreements and addressing agricultural non-tariff measures. Louise joined the division in 2016 after heading the department's biosecurity plant division. In this role, Louise oversaw the provision of scientific and technical advice to support Australia's agricultural exports and biosecurity risk mitigation, and the management and coordination of national responses to change in plant health status. Louise will speak to us today on the role for FTAs in the changing trade environment. So, Louise. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope um, everyone enjoyed their lunch. Um, I've been asked probably to also to speak a little bit slower, um, which is good because I've got um, a pretty slow drawl, so hopefully uh, most of you will understand uh, me as I go through. I'd also like to make sure that I thank the Grain Trades Association, the Australian Oil, um, Oil Seeds Federation, Pulse Australia for inviting me to speak today at the conference. I'm sure you're all aware that agriculture is a critical part of the economy. Australia is a competitive uh, net, net agriculture exporter. We export around two-thirds of our total production. Our ABARES, which is our economic forecaster within uh, the Australian government, forecasts the export earnings for farm commodities um, for, to be $48.7 billion for 1718, which is an increase of around $1 billion from 1617. Australia's broad acre cropping is the major part of Australia's success on the world markets. ABES is reporting that wheat and barley production this year should push the gross value of production around 20% higher, um, this year to $33.9 billion. The Australian grain industry is also a leader in innovation, and I think you heard this morning about uh, our R&D and how, that, how important that is, and we need to continue to uh, increase our productivity and our sustainable production methods to make sure that we um, have a future in, this, in these markets. But also the success of the grains industry is also supported in the trading environment by free trade agreements. Which, uh, with, our, with, with a number of our key um, 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 trading partners. So this is the aspect that I've been asked to uh, concentrate on today. So I'll be talking about free trade agreements and uh, the overall environment um, for, the, for our grains industry. Just to give you a little bit of a, and I'm, I'm, I didn't want to spend too much time on the current environment, but just to, I suppose, reiterate that, um, for example, the OECD is saying out to 26, 2026, um, the demand for grain is going to slow. So the future growth in crop production will be attained through increased yields. Um, through more, the only, the only, and through more efficient farming, fact, um, farming practices is the way that Australia is going to continue to excel uh, into the future. I think also as part of the environment, um, it's important that to understand the world stage is, continues to change, uh, particularly around clarity and direction of the US government trade policy and the impact that might have, have on growth, protections, growth projections and some of our markets. Um, I think it's also important to um, understand that uh, this, but there's a still strong economic um, growth in China over the recent years, and our understanding is the uh, Chinese government commitment to continue to maintain uh, um, that sort of growth in, in the coming years. So this presents opportunities um, to meet Australia, China's demands for agriculture and food commodities, um, and, and also um, for India's demand for um, commodities such as pulses. I'll quickly go on to the free trade agreements. Um, I really wanted to also emphasise there are three that actually ha have finished and they've been quite important for the grains industry. 
They're the, the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership, which is what we call the JPA, and that was um, concluded uh, in 2015, and that was good for them from the point of view of the grains industries with um, wheat and barley without a, qu a quote of tariffs and 3% uh, reduction in tariff in, um, on sorghum on the, on the, uh, on the first, 15th of January 2015. The Korean trade agreement, which we call the CAFTA, which again was significant for wheat, which elimination of 1.8% tariff and a 10% for wheat and 10% tariff for canola on entry into force in December 2014. China is now our largest agriculture, food, fisheries and forestry export, worth $10.3 billion in 2016, while Japan is our second largest, worth $4.8 billion, and Korea is our fifth, which is worth $3.3 billion, so significant markets. I'll touch on China in a bit more detail, but I just also wanted to make sure that you're aware there are a number of other FTAs, free, free, free trade agreements that are being negotiated at present. They're what we call the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is really a, a comprehensive partnership agreement with uh, our 10 ASEAN uh, countries, including, um, and as well as Japan, Korea, China, India, and of course Australia and New Zealand. That particular um, uh, partnerships we call RCEP is, um, encompasses those countries that we have trade with um, already, and that's about $30 billion, which is two thirds of what we export. So that's a significant agreement that we continue to work on. The other ones that you'll be interested in is the Indonesia Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Again, um, the intent is to try and conclude that one very quickly. And as you're all aware, um, Indonesia is one of the, and I think the biggest wheat market for, for Australia. We've just started negotiations with uh, free trade agreements with Peru and Hong Kong. And the expectation again is that they will, be, um, they will be concluded as quickly as possible. And there'll be opportunities for the grains industry in those as well. Um, the EU FTA, um, the view is um, hoping to get um, agreement for, to start negotiations in the next few months. So that's uh, obviously a significant one that will we'll start towards the end of the year if that's agreed. So back to the free trade agreement with China. Um, just to emphasise that that came into force in December 2015 and we've had two tariff cuts since then in January 2016 and in January 2017. Um, the, the, what I call the, the Chinese-Australia Free Trade Agreement, we call CHAFTA, so I'll refer to it as CHAFTA from now on. This continues to support the growth of our exports to China and has produced very, some very positive uh, um, outcomes for the Australian industry. CHAFTA completely eliminated tariffs on the imports of grain commodities um, that we, we export to China uh, on a few commodities, and that included uh, barley, uh, which has had a 3% tariff, and uh, sorghum, which had a 2% tariff, which was eliminated on entry into force in two th um, December 2015. It's important to note that other major uh, exporting countries um, have, got, have not got free, free trade agreements with China, and they include countries such as, and they are competitors, United States, Europe and Canada. So Australian barley and sorghum have been competitive advantage in the, in the Chinese market um, relative to competing countries. I did have a, um, an overhead just to give you a picture on um, particularly barley, um, the increase in imports into, into, um, of Australian barley into China over the last few years. So you can see the increase from the um, that's light green or aqua colour, which is Australia, so it's a significant increase um, over the last few years. Um, the next one I was just going to show, which also talks about barley again, but it shows you um, that that's also a significant increase um, um, from 2009 through to 2015-16. 
Um, of course, it's not all good news. Um, we were able to reduce a lot of the tariffs, but we also recognised that um, there were some sensitive sectors that weren't part of the agreement, and that includes wheat and rice. There is a built-in three-year review in the, in the um, agreement and we'll, we'll obviously work closely with um, industry and, and um, government to uh, see what we can do as part of those uh, review mechanisms. We've also got the regional economic partnership that we're currently negotiating, which obviously we have, um, we, have uh, um, we would like to continue to uh, um, discuss the uh, other grains industries and tariffs in that particular partnership. Um, I was particularly asked to, I suppose, comment on utilisation um, as part of the chapter agreement, so the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement. The information that I have is actually the utilisation um, of the chapter is actually generally quite strong across the grain sector. So that includes um, cereals, milled products, oil seeds, seeds, hay and fodder, um, but it's particularly strong in the, the bigger, high-value products such as barley, sorghum, fodder, oats and oil seeds. It's, it's clear, though, not all Australian grain traders are using the lower preferential tariff rates in CHAFTA, so this means that some of our exporters aren't uh, or may be missing out on a competitive price advantage of CHAFTA. While these cases are generally in the smaller ticket items, such as milled oats to China or sorghum to Japan, um, which aren't traded in large quantities, but it's still important for our um, growers and exporters. So we'll continue to work with our, those peak industry bodies to try and improve that uptake. As part of the, um, the commitment that the Australian government has to exports of China, we also, under the Australian government's white paper, we've also put uh, more resources, um, agricultural councillors in Beijing. I'm sure some of you um, know them quite well, depending on how much you trade. But it's also important to remember the reason why we've got them in there, um, from the agricultural point of view, is that the export in the environment is, is good and I'm painting a very rosy picture uh, with removals of tariffs, but it does not address technical market access or non-tariff measures. So those those sorts of uh, barriers or issues um, need to be resolved as we go forward. So um, Australia will continue to, the Australian government will continue to improve, try and improve our market access opportunities. We'll con try and con we will continue to work on the technical market access issues, particularly with the, with the agriculture department in Japan, Korea and China to make sure that these three landmark uh, FTAs um, continue to be more and more effective. I was just going to also um, note um, the re another looking at the environment. I know one of my colleagues is going to give you more detail on uh, the, um, the uh, changing policy environment in China. But again, um, our view also is that Australia's long-standing government policy of self-sufficiency in grain appears to be relaxing. It, with imports seen to be a viable way to en ensure China's food security. Consumer preferences for meat consumption has also resulted in an increase in feed grain demand, as China's domestic grain production has been unable to keep up with the feed demand. So their imports, imports from Australia have therefore risen, for example, sorghum. China's demand for the quality grain products to address domestic production shortfall provides Australia with an excellent opportunity to supply this important part of the Chinese market. Despite good outcomes from the grain under CHAFTA and the changes in the grain policies towards uh, imports to help meet demand, it is critical that Australia continues to meet uh, Chinese requirements. We shouldn't forget that food safety is a priority for China and we, are not, we should not underestimate China's requirements and expectations in this area. It is important that Australia continues to meet these requirements when exporting grain to China. I can't emphasise that particular point enough in the, in the current environment. The Australian government's doing our bit. Um, it's trying to develop strong stronger linkages with the Chinese authorities to support this and I encourage you not to be complacent and to commit to supplying the market with the, with the requirements the Chinese um, have put in place. 
There are competitors such as Ukraine waiting in the wings to take share of our market. I've just put up there just to give you a picture of those competitors in the, both the China and the India market just to think about uh, as, I, as I go forward. We've made strong progress, um, the Australian government, with our industry players um, in technical market access, and we have an agreement on wheat and barley that we produced in 2015. This is critical and underpins our $1.8 billion trade each year. We are also uh, working closely with the Chinese authorities on new market access protocols for a range of other commodities which are significant, such as canola and sorghum. We are also progress pro progressing broader technical consultations with the Chinese Quarantine Agency on grain issues in the support of this particular trade. If I just turn now to India, um, turning, uh, India is the second uh, uh, largest producer of rice and the third of wheat production. Uh, of these two staple grains, are, these two staple grains are really encouraged by the Indian government um, for, the, for, the, uh, for the growers in India to, um, to grow. However, uh, India's trade is actually moving in some ways in the opposite direction with diminishing domestic sp stocks which has resulted, I think you're all probably aware, over the last four, well, four months since December 2016, where we saw an increase in the, in, in the imports of Australian wheat into uh, India, and we saw the export of rice from India. It's important to remember that Australia, India's food security considerations have been driven by grain trading behaviour, um, over the last decade, um, where, for example, where food prices were escalating, the Australian government, uh, sorry, the Indian government banned exports of wheat and rice. But over the last number of years, um, we have seen uh, some of those um, uh, export bans lifted. The Australian agriculture exports have enjoyed um, an actual and exceptional growth over the last few years with exports passing $2.8 billion in 1617 uh, financial year. This is a 500% growth um, from five years ago. While the growth in the range, range of commodities, a range of commodities, um, these probably include um, probably a narrow band and they include pulses, cotton wool, almonds, wheat and paper. The real success story, though, is pulses and grains. In 1617, India's largest supplier, we were it's India's largest supplier of chickpeas and the second largest supplier of wheat. Australia exported $50 million worth of peas and $180 million of lentils and over a billion dollars of chickpeas last financial year. This reflects both value and volume of trade, with the exports of chickpeas passing $1.1 billion. We are well placed to take advantage of these record prices, with a combination of strong gro growing season in Australia and Indian, um, poor Indian monsoon seasons in recent years. While the wheat trade we know fluctuates in India significantly, Australian producers and exporters have, had, have to take this opportunity and make hay while the sun shines. The FTA, specific FTA with India will be slow. Uh, we're in there for the long haul, but India also is in our regional economic cooperation partnership agreement. So again, we're looking for um, agricultural as part of that negotiations. The future is also bright for the market with the Indian demand for agricultural products expected to continue to grow strongly and outstripping growth in the Indian production. In conclusion, I think uh, we're well placed to continue to, keep, uh, to be a key supplier of grains in the world. Um, the key policy changes in China align well with Australia's ability to supply high quality grain into a major market that appears to be becoming more open and less regulated than it has been previously. I encourage exporters to take advantage of CHAFTA and other free trade agreements. Given the growth in the pulse exports to India, Australia remains a major and preferred supplier um, to this market 
uh, but the free trade agreements with, China, uh, with India may take some time. So in conclusion, I, I have a very, in my view, uh, you know, I have been here, for, I have sort of talked in the grains industry probably maybe 10 years ago, um, and, you know, the cycle goes around where we have good decades and bad decades, so it's a, it's a pretty positive message. Um, but I do have, a, um, uh, I suppose, a message around food safety. This particular issue is very important to China. It's very important to India. Food safety will be, is, is, a, is, is a place where um, you need to understand those importing country requirements. Something that you think is trivial, those particular countries may not think are trivial. So it's about the Australian government having to certify what the ex exporters put in front of us. The exporters are responsible for presenting goods that comply with those particular countries' requirements. So I can't emphasise enough to you in the room um, that do you know where your product's going and do you know what those requirements are and are you comfortable that you are meeting those requirements for the future of the Australian grains industry? So on that note, I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to talk at this year's Grain Conference. Thank you. Great. Th th thanks, Louise. Um, our next speaker is uh, Erland Egg, uh, Trade and Agricultural Research Manager at Ch China Policy. Erland has worked for China Policy since 2013 and led the Trade and Agricultural team since 2015. Advising a global client network, his team closely tracks and maps China's policies and debates in trade and agriculture and their geopolitical dimensions. Key areas include markets and market access, investment, trade agreements, WTO and food security. With multilateral systems in flux and China assuming a more assertive position, his team closely monitors new trade modes and patterns emerging from the country's more active engagement with the world, in particular through its Belt and Road Initiative. Erland studied social anthropology at the University of Oslo and the University College London. Erland's presentation today is on policy developments in China, implications for grain imports. Erland. All right. Um, let me see if this works. Oh, there you go. Oh, let's start here. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, let me say thank you for the organizer. Um, I'm coming all the way from China. I live there and work there. I've been there since 2008. Uh, and I'm very happy to come here and talk about my favorite topic, uh, China. Um, <clears throat> and um, I spoke early this year at an um, event in Shanghai organized by the same um, organizations. Um, uh, and this time we have been given the opportunity to speak twice. So uh, I will today focus on China's domestic um, policy transitions and what they are thinking domestically. And then my colleague, uh, Philippa, will tomorrow talk uh, about China in global trade. <clears throat> Okay, so there are massive changes happening in China and their policy and their food security strategy. Um, this started with China jo joining WTO in 2001, um, moving away from a planned economy. They continued to tax agriculture for a few years even after they entered. Uh, production costs was, were, uh, were still low. Um, and, um, and they were, in fact, like you see here, they were a net exporter. Um, with time, uh, production costs have come up, and with uh, global prices falling after 2008, they faced a big issue on how to 
maintain production, maintain employment, maintain social stability, and they started supporting um, prices at a much higher level than international prices um, in hope that global prices will come back. And they didn't do that. And with the new administration coming in in 2012, 2013, they realized that they need to change this fundamentally. Uh, and it starts with moving away from a target of being self-sufficient. If we move on, we can see uh, China's uh, uh, balance in, um, in value. Um, 2015 um, is a special year. Um, they had problems with, um, with corn, uh, and they stopped supporting corn prices in 2016, and imports fell. Um, <clears throat> this year, the, um, the number is basically stable. Um, the first half of this year, uh, in terms of value, it increased uh, less than 1%. But I think what is interesting is to break this a bit down. What did they import? What did they uh, not import? Uh, so I noted a few numbers. So corn this year is down 74%. Corn import, down 74%. Uh, sorghum is down 26 And soy is down, did I say soy? No. Soy is down 16 uh, On the other side, wheat is up 48%, almost only from Australia. Um, that might be an issue to look into um, because, and China has, they have now a new standard for argot, which seems to be a technical issue, uh, issued in June, and in July they started stopping shipments of wheat from Australia because the argot levels on the wheat was too high according to their standard. Barley is up 106% so far this year. Uh, and there we have the snail issue, uh, uh, which might be, you know, if they, if they wanted to, to uh, make problems, they probably could, or they are saying that we, we know there's an issue there. <clears throat> so they're moving away from self-sufficiency. Um, still, the government is planning, as always. Over the next five years, says uh, the Minister of Agriculture here, um, production will approximately uh, hit 600 million tons, and demand is 700. So we need to import. And this is really, when he said this, this is really the first time they acknowledged the import. They imported already about 100 million tons already at that time. But now he's saying, OK, it's fine. We will do it. Um, <clears throat> And I think in the Fiverr plan the year after, or last year, uh, they settled on domestic uh, production on 650. That is the target. So it's between 650 and 700. So they can import 100 to 150. That's what the government is saying. Um, I think last year they imported something like 105 million tons. And I think this year, uh, actually, yeah, it, 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 it seems to be hitting 120, 120 million tons. Of course, most of that is. Um, soybean. <clears throat> so let me stress that China is really at a critical stage of a transition away from planned economy, traditional agriculture, towards a, an industry and modern agriculture. And this is more than just a normal transition in China. Uh, because they have had they set up uh, the Communist Party 50 years ago set up more than 50 years ago set up a system where of classes um, the agriculture population um, is more a peasant than a farmer it's a it's a class it's a status it's not a profession uh, so one of the things China is doing now is to saying okay farmers needs to be a profession it's not a primary industry only. We need to think in terms of an industry. So farmers must be allowed to invest in other sectors, and other sectors must be allowed to invest in agriculture. So this consolidation and f changes in fundamental laws are happening now. Uh, in two months, 
probably around two months, um, they will hold a party congress where they will change the constitution or uh, amend the constitution. And um, we're looking very closely at what they are saying about collective ownership. Um, so you have, an, uh, at the moment, there is a blurry line. Um, but it seems like this will be allowed to be traded. You, you can get a share in the collective, and the, like a stock company, if you're a farmer or a peasant, and you will be allowed to trade this user right on farmland in the collective area. <clears throat> so the, China is now moving onto a new industrialized uh, system. But at the same time, China needs to face their uh, reality. And the current reality, and current big issues, is that they in fact have an over, they have overproduction. They produce too much food. Um, and more than that, they are lacking quality and safe food. So the market doesn't necessarily buy what the producers produce. The government has been supporting the producers by and not thought about um, um, the market. Um, so they need to move, um, they need to do something about the structure of, of how they produce towards more quality production. Um, China has a massive, probably massive, um, um, environment issue. Um, the obvious one is air, air pollution. Um, in fact, air pollution was not considered an agriculture problem until recently. Uh, in March, the, the government had a meeting, met with some agriculture experts, and one of the experts pointed out that, well, all this agriculture waste is contributing very much to air pollution. And the prime minister then said, I've never heard that before. Tell me more about it. Um, water. Water in China has been basically free for our farmers to use. And water scarcity is becoming a big issue, and the government will want to introduce a water pricing system. Um, and soil pollution is also severe. Um, and to deal with this will be very costly, obviously. Um, another issue is that the support and subsidy uh, system is reaching its, um, its ceilings in their WTO commitments. Um, and that is becoming a problem. And they're dealing with that, moving from away from market distorting policies um, and price support. But also what is important to remember is that the whole economy is in transition away from an export-led economy made in China towards a consumption and uh, made by China. Uh, so they need to move to this new uh, system, but also uh, deliver on the promise to farmers uh, that their incomes will increase or double by 2020 from 2010 levels. That's probably the most important promise that the government and party in China uh, is, is giving. And how are they going to do that? To, with um, uh, a big agriculture population that has blurry rights, uh, has probably poor education, and have no experience in an industrialized system, and has been taken care of for many, many years. Um, and the bottom line there is that it will be very expensive for the government. Um, the good story there is that the government knows that, and they are providing credit, they're raising money, they're pushing a lot of money into the agriculture sector. However, down the track, that uh, needs to be paid, right? So they need to professional agriculture, and, um, um, and they need to start to make profits. So let's uh, look a little bit more on, the, on this new strategy that the government has. Um, before, it was all about securing supply. Um, to feed this enormous population, and basically at all costs. Um, now they have a new strategy. Um, instead of um, focus on production, they will focus on the ability for production. And that is a major policy change. So the government is saying, well, 
we need to maintain arable land, we need to maintain the capacity, ability, but we don't want to support it in peacetimes. If there's a war or critical times and or, you know, the, the world don't want to sell to us, we still have the ability to feed ourselves. But we don't need to do it. We will use import because it's, more sustainable. it's a more sustainable model. It's a m major change in policy, um, narrative, strategy. Um, <clears throat> So the money now is being poured in not to the farmer buying the products from the farmers, but they are being, they, they go into the farmland. Irrigation, um, flattening out land, machineries, professionalizing farmers, um, and, um, and giving professionals um, the upper hand in consolidating uh, the industry to, to, to create this ability to ensure, if needed, they can produce, and if not, they will still be um, competitive uh, on a day-to-day -day basis by not producing where it's too costly, where the market is not paying for it. Um, another uh, issue here is the price, and a major issue. Um, the government used to set the price, and they still very much do for wheat and rice. Uh, they stopped for corn last year, and they stopped for um, rapeseed the year before, and soy the year before that. Um, and they are now trying to find a mechanism of how the market can lead a more uh, lead price setting on a level that the government is happy with. Uh, they will intervene if they are not. Uh, and they are trying to find a mechanism. How can we? create a mechanism where the market can understand when we intervene by using the food reserve or by allowing more or less import. Um, and in order to do that, they want to develop a functional futures market. The future market is very important for China to develop um, because it would guide the government what the future price will be. And if they disagree with it, then it will take actions before it happens. Right? Uh, but before we get there, uh, they need to solve their statistical problems, uh, number problems. Uh, this year, uh, every 10 years, China has a, a census, agriculture census. So they're now checking all the farms, checking the numbers. We expect those numbers to come out soon. Um, and there are expectations that the pork numbers, for instance, in China, China has 50% of uh, the global pork production. That is probably... 25% less than what they are saying it is, for instance. Now this is going to change policy, and it's going to change how people think about it as well. So look for those numbers. Uh, it also means that China is not thinking about China, they are thinking globally. They understand that if global prices are good, China will be good. Uh, and they're investing and making money, want to make money abroad. Um, that is different from the previous thinking where they looked for resources abroad and bought it at all costs. Didn't think that they needed to be profitable. So agriculture companies now buying up or engaging globally is thinking much more about, about profitability. Um, <clears throat> and a very major um, tactic is to, from the central government in China is saying, we are not, no longer responsible for food security. And they've devolved it down to a provincial level. And they're saying, you tell us how much you can produce, and we will hold you accountable for that. We will provide you a credit line, but you need to make sure that you make money on this and you pay us back. <clears throat> and the local government will then go to their companies and say the same story. Um, and it's creating much more transparency, accountability um, than what we're used to. And this is being built up as we speak, but how long time will it take? We don't know. Uh, there are also new laws being written um, that will support this new system. Um, well, I talked a bit about this before, that China is moving from the focus on resource maximization to what they call ecosystem approach. Um, what I want to stress here is that they're adding costs at the moment. The production cost in China is already very high, but with this new... Uh, policies, they have reinstated VAT on fertilizer, a water pricing, 
system will come into place. Um, they are putting taxes on waste treatment, uh, you know, policies that incentivizes waste treatment, uh, and uh, and, um, and and this will add costs. Um, and the, the, uh, what I want to stress here is that this is really where China is heading, is towards quality. Is that they want to be seen as a quality provider for their own people and for the world. Um, and I will come back to that point, I hope. If not, ask me about that point. Um, um, yeah, and I've already talked about this, to be honest. Um, an insurance industry is building up. We see uh, what they call dragon head companies are leading the way to consolidate. Mm -hmm. I talked before about that uh, farmers can now trade, or will be allowed to trade their user right for the farm. Now, big companies in China are now buying up these rights to, to run the, the production for them. And they can hire them as workers to work you know, on day to day. And then they will bring in technology, they can bring in um, distribution and so on. And the risk, they will take the risk. Um, so, if, we, if that's what's happening domestically, so how will this affect um, trade and import? Well, they're now saying that what they call moderate import is okay. So, they say we can't just open the gate, we need to do this step by step carefully, uh, because no one out there can secure our needs demands. So, we need, to, we, we need to import, and we need to import more in the future, um, but we need to find partners abroad. And this is what they're really looking for, partners. Partners who are willing to say, we will help you, and we will comply with your standards. Um, we will, um, and, and be reliable. Um, standards, like uh, Luis uh, stressed, is becoming extremely important to build these partnerships with China. Uh, they've just revised 6, 000, almost 6,000 national standards in food. Two weeks ago, uh, they said we've, the last five years we have now consolidated and there are, I think, 1,500 new standards. Now, these are, it's very important to pay attention to. The uh, ergo, ergot issue uh, comes as a result of this. Uh, the ergot standard was released in 23rd of June, 4th of July, there were reports that Australian shipments were being stopped because of not meeting these new standards. Uh, maybe not fair. Um, I'm not sure what happened with that case, but it's, it's, you don't want to run into these issues. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you want to find partners or find information channels where you get updated on what's happening in China. And I'm also providing that information. <coughs> Um, import is the, the, the prime function for import is to control inflation in China. That's how the government sees it. They don't really care too much about the, uh, the, the value. They, can, they look at quanta. They look at this is how much we need to eat to be safe. And they look at can we provide it affordably to our people. If the domestic price is going up, then they will look for more import and so on. So they're trying to plan this. Uh, it's not so easy. Uh, and they're learning. And they're trying to create new systems where they can be, where, where for them, global trade become more predictable. Um, and that's why they keep, well, the TRQs will be in place for now. Uh, that's why technical barriers is increasing, uh, because they want to be in control over this. But in the future, I think China will move towards being more of a trader themselves, being a hub. I heard this morning that no one believes that China will export wheat. Well, they've started exporting wheat this year uh, because, well, they can buy it from Kazakhstan for a cheaper price and add price and sell it to Vietnam. Well, that's what they do um, because they have the capacity for that. They have the infrastructure for that. So they can add value in China and then sell abroad. And, and that makes a lot of sense for them. Yeah. Um, and they also want to diversify import. So it's, I would, and that's why I raised this issue with wheat is it's now going up and barley is going up 100% so far this year and it's only from Australia. Well, 
China don't like that they only have one supplier. Um, that can be an issue. Um, okay, let's see. <clears throat> um, yeah, let me address this very quickly. Okay, well, let's let me skip that since that alarm was. <laughs> Uh, so this is my last slide, actually, um, trying to answer the question, is quality uh, trump card? Absolutely is the answer to that. China is looking for quality. There is demand uh, for quality, and there's lack of quality in China. Um, uh, however, I think most people in China still care m more for price than quality. Uh, they, they're still in uh, uh, saving, uh, you know, saving for their apartments, and if they can cut costs somewhere, they will do it. Um, but obviously, the middle class is growing very, very quickly, and I think an issue for the uh, providers and suppliers to China is to develop uh, new segments uh, of in the high quality end of the market, where China probably can't provide it themselves, right? So. Um, well, actually, let me go back to this. So, manto, you know, the bread they eat in China ever for breakfast, is probably taken by by Chinese uh, suppliers. Though I know that some Australians think they can enter that market, I don't think so. But I do think that there is a lot of space for bread. And I do think high quality noodle and so on is something that where they're huge market opportunities, but you need to create a desire. Um, at the moment, I can talk from my, uh, I have a friend, or actually my girlfriend, uh, who come, come from another part of China where we, and then where we live, and with e-commerce, she now can buy the local noodle from that place, and that's what she's doing. She loves the local noodle from her hometown. And when I moved abroad, I, you know, I got my mom always to send me chocolate and uh, the Norwegian chocolate. Then I discovered that, well, Norwegian chocolate isn't that good after being a bit, you know, trying other things. And I think China is in that stage now where they have a bit nostalgia for their, you know, for their mom's food, but soon they will open up for new experiences, and that's where the opportunity lies. Um, and my last point, uh, so that's why I would like to suggest that maybe you should focus on the consumers in China. Uh, not only focus on, on China's um, well, traders and suppliers, but obviously uh, you need to do both for time being. Yeah. So that's all for me. Thank you. Great. Th thanks, Helen. Um, our third speaker for this session is Sumit Gupta, business manager of McDonald Peltz Global Commodities. Sumit started um, McDonald Peltz India Southeast Asia office in August 2014. After nine years at Cargill, where he was involved in the Indian grain origination, customer management, export and supply chain program, he subsequently joined Olam in Singapore, where he was handling corn trade books for Asia and the Black Sea. Sumit is a regular speaker at Global Grains, Black Sea Oil, IBC Asia, Oils and Fats India, and Global Trade Review. Sumit's presentation today is on India, future import demands for grains and pulses. Good afternoon, everybody. I think it's the most difficult session post lunch to keep people awake. Thank you for doing that job. And so, uh, India, it's always a land of enigma, and uh, people look towards India as a problem child, as a trouble thing, because it's not regular in the global markets. And anything which is not regular is always has an element of surprise. So to answer this question, I did a small survey here uh, outside asking this question. In past, uh, use one word to explain the consistency of Indian global markets. I said, no, you don't have to answer it in a sentence, just answer it in a word. All of them said bad. I said, oh, no, I think uh, this is not the right question. Let me modify it a bit. I said, okay, uh, 
in present, use two words, since one word was not significant enough to express your emotions. So express it in two words. In present, what's the consist consistency and importance of Indian global markets? They said, not bad. I said, are you sure from bad to not bad? It changes the entire meaning of the phrase. I said, OK, maybe I'm asking the wrong question, but I'm giving you a luxury of words. Now use three words to explain. In future, please explain the importance of Indian global markets. All of them said, not bad enough to ignore. And this is the story of our presentation, where the Indian markets have moved from a place of non-importance to a place where it holds a promise for the future. And this is, we have tried to define the sentiment in these five things, population, precipitation, that is monsoon, production, uh, prices in India, and peripherals, which is the global trade flow, how it's going to happen, how we are going to change the dynamics of the global trade in the times to come. Before coming here, again, we did uh, some kind of analysis to see uh, what exactly is India. If I have to explain 1.3 billion people to somebody in Australia, how, do shall, how shall I explain it? The best way to explain it is there are 12,617 trains which run in India, and they carry 23 million passengers every night who sleeps on train, which is equivalent to Australian population. So that means we consume 7 million tons of wheat on wheels every year, which is approximately equal to consumption of Australia in wheat terms. So this is the gambit, or this is what, uh, this is what does the population of India means. Just to give you an example, we add one kid every two seconds. So after power generation, growing babies is the biggest profession in India. And similarly, in Australia, it takes 91 seconds to add one more kid. So that's, if you look at the geometric terms, it means a lot. Because arithmetically, it does not make that, that bigger difference. But when you go at the geometric progression, it makes a lot of difference. If you, uh, and specifically, a country like Australia, which is a producer of grain, and a country like India, which is a consumer of grain, what is happening today has less relevance than what can happen in future. So if you look at the direction of global trade or direction of population, how it is moving, all the producing countries, that is South America, Australia, they have relatively stagnant population, and the population not growing enough to offset the increase in the production potential. While the countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, and Malaysia, which all are in vicinity, their population is increasing at a much faster pace than the, than the growth of their production potential. So that, it means that going forward, we are going to have larger trade flow long, and a more long distance trade flow. The consumer are going to uh, consume more, and the producers are going to produce for the consumers. So either the producing mechanism have to become more effective, or in the consuming countries, the food has to become more effective or more uh, efficient. So overall, one should have uh, much more faith, and one should expect uh, the countries like India and China to import a lot more in times to come. Uh, presentation guys are not kind enough to give me 30 minutes to explain about so many countries in one go. India is just not one country. If I have to put the population equivalent of every province, we can talk about half of the world. Our one of the biggest province, that is Uttar Pradesh, is equal to the population of Brazil. How much corn does Brazil consume? Around 58 million tons. And how much corn is consumed in India? Around 16 million tons. Is it because we cannot consume more, or we are not producing more? The bigger reason lies in how we have evolved till now. Till now, India has evolved more like a self-sufficiency-driven country, and which is driven more by availability than the consumer potential. But with rapid industrialization, with a changing social scheme, with more uh, service economy, and growth in GDP, we believe we'll move from self-sufficiency to the consumer potential. And that's where lies the bigger opportunity. Because as a country, our population is still growing. We are going to become bigger than China by 2027, officially but unofficially maybe bigger than China even today, because we don't count the neighbors in. So keeping all these factors in mind and looking at the population pressure on land, 
we can for sure say is that India, India's participation in global trade is going to grow up. And it is going to not uh, go up in, uh, in arithmetic way, but it's going to go up in geometric way, which is, which is largely true if we look at the numbers, how Indian participation in global trade has increased since 2005, which was only 5 million tons, to approximately 32 million tons within last 10, 12 years. And it is going to become faster. It is, it is going to grow at a faster pace, because there is a tipping point always. And we have passed the tipping point where our production can match our consumption levels. Now, as a, as a supplier, you think, OK, India is an important geography. We understand that. But uh, India brings its own challenges. Yes, we agree. When you look towards India, these are the first factors that come in anybody's mind who is a supplier or a consumer into Indian market. That is the regulatory concerns, unreliable supplier, unreliable customers, bad logistics. We fully agree. These are all the things of the uh, present. But as India will be dependent more on the global trade, and global trade will be more participative in the global ma Indian markets, all these factors, all these things will change. And importantly, uh, why, why, we, uh, why these challenges are there? Because India was a self-sufficient geography. We never need. Uh, or there was never a need to rely on the global market the way we have today. So these are the challenges of the present, but not are the challenges of the future. Moving on on the, on the weather part, if you look, India gets impacted by the El Nino weather pattern, same as Australia. And we get less rainfall and a warmer temperature during the El Nino years. It affects our monsoons adversely. And during the La Nina years, we have good rainfall. So India technically act as a global supply hedge also. Because during the La Nina years, we have good crops. And if we are able to build stocks during uh, the previous years, we export into global markets. That's taking the inflationary pressure off. So we are just not an importer. Worse, not imported till uh, now. We were a big exporter also. But things may change as government stocks have dwindled a lot. And things are changing quite fast. And during the El Nino year, which has happened in the last two years, Indian production goes down significantly and become net importer of everything. And specifically, it is true for two major commodities, that is uh, pulses, because uh, it is grown in red fed areas, and second, wheat, because all the grain shortage in the country ex expresses itself in the wheat imports, because we cannot import any other grain. We cannot import rice. We cannot import corn because of the GMO, non-GMO concerns. And uh, other commodities, are, uh, other grains consumption is not significant enough. This is uh, the El Nino and La Nina patterns and how monsoons have behaved. Largely, we can see during the El Nino years, monsoon performance goes down significantly, and thus impacting our production of pulses and uh, grains. And those who are pulses trader for sure can superimpose El Nino years and the prices of pulses and can see, we see majority of the rally in the pulses is witnessed during those years. India's role in the global market, wheat market, this is to reemphasize the point that we are just not the importer, but we were the big exporter during 2012, 2013, which were the years of global supply shortages. India exported around 12 million tons of wheat during those two years. And in last year, we imported approximately 6 million tons of wheat. Out of that, 2.5 million tons came from Australia, which is approximately 40% of the market. Is this trend going to continue? Answer is possibly yes, which we may see in detail going forward. Is this trend going to fade away? Are we going to become an exporter again? The answer lies in the government policy of public distribution system, minimum support price, and open market sales schemes. How these three schemes or three policies interact with each other and leads to a market price. If global prices are below uh, the uh, minimum support price and OMSS price, India will import. If global prices are higher than that, then domestic inflation will go up and it will match up to the glo global prices to import. This is on the corn markets. We were the fifth bigger expo biggest exporter in 2012-13. Now came to a stage we have started importing corn. Last year, we imported approximately 100,000 tons of corn. And the year before that, 400,000 tons of corn, which is a big change from an exporter of around 5 million tons to net importer of uh, 500,000 tons. So is uh, the industry growing, or it is a production shift? Answer is uh, because of bad monsoon, production has gone down. but 
in India, meat production has increased significantly. It is because uh, of the ban, uh, beef ban, we are seeing entire industry shifting to poultry consolidation, which means more consolidated demand and demand uh, which shift from coarse grain largely to corn, because that's the main ingredient of the, pulse, uh, of the uh, uh, poultry industry. This is a case study which I always present when we talk about India and China. If you look at China, they were importing around 30 million tons of beans in year 2005-06, and India was importing around 4.8 million tons of vegetable oil. In 2015-16, we imported around 15 and a half million tons of veg oil, and China imported around 80 million tons of beans. So the growth of beans import in China was around 280%. And as against that, growth of vegetable oil import into India is 319%. Because India is still a vegetable protein market. India is not an animal protein market. So that's why our need on protein is expressed in terms of vegetable oil. Or if you extrapolate this number into soybean and multiply it by five, we are also importing around 75 million tons of beans equivalent oil into India. And that is one big factor that needs to be noticed, that India is expressing itself in various terms. In import of pulses, which has gone up from 1.5 million tons to 5.5 million tons. Import of vegetable oil, which has grown in the same proportion as bean import has grown in China. If you look at the meat product uh, growth in South Asia, not only in India, it has grown up by around 70% in last uh, 10 years. Which is, which is a sizable increase, mainly backed by the poultry and uh, industry. Every, all of us talk that India is, uh, the Indian grain complex is very volatile. Answer is yes, it is very volatile because our ending stocks is only 12%, which is even poorer than sub-Sahara region. And when you compare this with the countries like China, which has an ending stock of 55%, or any other country, uh, with the equivalent population, or uh, we are uh, by far the lowest ending stock country. What it means, any adverse weather phenomena leads to higher weather volatility and price volatility in India. And that's where a local Indian trader is always long, because you always believe a small blip can lead to high increase or high inflationary pressure in the country. And that's where Indian government always act whenever prices start going up because they know it's a spiral and it keeps going up till the next crop. And that's where the short-term policy decisions answer lies in how the stock management is done in the country. Are we taking any action for that? Because in the previous presentation, we were talking about what China is going to do 25 years from now. In India, we only talk about what government is going to do two months from now. So these two are very ge different geographies who manages their products, their countries in very different way. Is there a more successful, uh, is there one model more successful than other? Answer is we don't know because both the countries have survived and thrived for so many years. If you look at the China's grain consumption, it is around 510 million tons as against 240 million tons in India. It is uh, mainly because of the meat consumption in China and still a cereal-based diet in India. It is, is it going to change? Answer for sure it is going to change. Because if you uh, look specifically about the myth buster that India is a vegetarian country, answer is no. Large part of the country in India has started consuming meat products. But question is, are we consuming it seven days a week or only once in a week or twice in a week, which is driven more by the income? rather than the availability. So as the income level of the country will go up, as uh, the uh, uh, people will get more aspirational, you will see the meat consumption per day will go up, and hence the grain consumption in the country is bound to increase. Can we increase uh, the grain uh, production in the country? Answer is we are hitting that limit. From last five years, our peak wheat production is 95 million tons. Can we add area? Answer is very few limited chances because we are hitting our gross and net irrigation potential in the country. So what are the better opportunities? I believe as a country we'll move from grain to more horticulture production. We will move from less uh, uh, yielding crops to more yielding crops. And the pulses is one crop in which whose yield has not changed since 1960. India was producing an average yield of 800 kg per hectare in 1960, and even today, the average yield in pulses is same. So are we bound to lose area in pulses as uh, the grain 
consumption in the country go up, as the grain prices in the country go up, answer is for sure. As the area will, will become more irrigated, the grain prices will go up in the country. The, pulses, the, the commodities or the products which have a lesser yield potential will lose to the higher technology crops. And grains are leading the bank or, uh, in terms of yield increase. So keeping on the same point, this is the life of a pulse trader now, Nicholas Talib, who has said that volatility is good. If, you, if there are pulses traders, and if you ask them, is volatility good, all of them will answer no. Because uh, India is a big importer of pulses, and we have seen in recent years, it's been too volatile. The answer lies from the fact, because we have uh, multiple factors, the regulation, government data, inaccuracy or accuracy, MBR fumigation, phyto, import margins, weather patterns, uh, the global response of farmers world over against the increased prices of pulses, how the Indian domestic, Indian farmer has responded to those changes. And overall, if you put the summation of all those facts, production, uh, pulses production has increased more than the consumption has increased in last one year. So uh, it was a black swan event. The production world over, if it is good in US, Canada, Australia, Black Sea in one year, which has never happened in past, but it is, it is one year which will take a lot of weak-hearted people from out away from the market, but which is good in a way because the consumption of pulses in long term is increasing in the country, and uh, we expect it to go up as the protein uh, percentage in diet of Indian consumer has gone up from 27 to 33 percent in last 10 years, and government or we, uh, it is expected to increase by around 10 percent in next five years and it is going to come mainly from pulses. So the overall expenditure of an individual, of a common Indian man is to go up when he is going to uh, consume pulses, and hence the debt consumption is going to go up. Now, don't extrapolate this, uh, this number in 10 million. You have to extrapolate this number for 1.3 billion people, which means a lot of demand. Uh, uh, if you look at the pulses, Indian, uh, India's uh, production of uh, chickpeas especially, which is a product of uh, interest here, uh, the drop in chickpeas production in Australia is less than the increase in production of chickpeas in India. You don't have to look at the absolute number because Indian absolute number is, uh, these are the government numbers. So they may make sense, they may not make sense, but you have to look at the relative change. Relative change of two million tons of increased production is more than the drop in Australia, and that's where we are seeing a tapered uh, interest in the new crop uh, chickpeas from India. And that is here to stay, but the set is staged largely by the how we are going to behave, or farmer is going to behave in October, November, December, how he is going to plant chickpeas, or he is going to go for the alternate crops. In terms of alternate crops, we don't see even at this level any other crop giving a higher realization to farmer than chickpeas. So it will be very interesting to, to see how the acreages will shift towards OND, and it will set uh, the demand uh, for the crops going forward. Uh, wheat in India is largely is uh, dependent on, as I mentioned earlier, farmer production, FCI, the price they give in terms of minimum support price, state buying and, and a distribution of goods by the government of India bases to the, uh, in the public distribution system and open market sales scheme. If you look at MSP, that is an intervention price, it's a one-way street. It only goes up, can never go down. So what does it mean? If global st prices stay where they are, every year India import parity is only going to become better. So if that's the case, that means the spread is always going to be wider and private industry is going to shift towards the imported goods and government is going to buy and distribute to the, uh, to, uh, under their various schemes. So on, on, the, on wheat specifically, we can be sure that this trade flow is going to exist provided Australian wheat prices don't go above $275 CFR India or $260 CFR India. That depends on what is the local price in India, which is driven by minimum support price. This is to show how the ending stocks are going to behave in India. Last year, we had a bumper crop. Before that, our, uh, in year 2015-16, open government of India opening stock was 13.6 million tons, and government of India bought 23 million tons of wheat. So total stock with government of India was 36.6 million tons. 
our government distribution was 29 million tons and hence opening stock this year was 7 million government of india bought 30.8 so net net nothing changes for government of india we have taken a assumption that government of india gives no wheat in the privates and only do their free schemes for the poor people even then our ending stock will be only 11 million ton which is only 13% of total consumption which means only one and a half months of total stocks in the country so import of wheat by the private sector is going to stay there is going to increase provided uh, 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 government does not increase duty or don't do something irrational to kill the demand but otherwise in a normal circumstance we should expect this trend to continue in terms of uh, buffer stock we are still not comfortable especially on wheat and uh, uh, buffer uh, stock norms in the country has to increase because the global uncertainty and price volatility is only increasing this is the wheat lineup which is of interest especially for the australian exporters we imported around 2.5 million tons of wheat and out of that 2 million tons only came in south that means south is very quality conscious pocket west is more faq east doesn't care whether it's faq or uh, australian whatever is cheap so uh, our import has to be focused more from the south indian milling demand perspective and uh, this was a 40% market share so uh, these are the thoughts that i had and specifically thanks to the australian traders and farmers we have started winning more matches as we have started importing more as imports are going to go up that means our winning percentage against australia is going to go up thank you very much <laughs> Sumit, I'm not sure how kind these questions are going to be now, aimed at you after that. Um, thank you all three. Um, do, do we have any questions? Hello, yes, my name is Brett Stevenson from Market Check. I just wanted to ask a question in respect to China and agricultural policy. Um, I notice you're mentioning about land ownership there, or at least collectives ownership and transferring ownership within the collective. Um, China's been very proactive from the joint venture front in terms of manufacturing industry. I want from you know outside investors and that sort of thing. Are they interested at all to bring in technology management support at all that sort of thing, or even investment in agriculture? From a policy point of view, is this working? Okay. Um, well, I guess I will answer. Um, yes, that's very clearly. Um, technology is the solution for for a lot of China's competitiveness uh, problems. Um, technology includes, I mean, services, everything. Um, I should address, and I know you want to ask this question, so I'll address that immediately. GMO is something that China is considering. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's an interesting question for India as well. I know there are similar debates in India. Uh, mustard, uh, I don't know if it has it been improved? Or? Uh, for this, for the field trials, yes. Field trials, exactly. So China is preparing for GMO. That's, they haven't made a decision. They are now considering, should we do GMO in, in China? Or can we, they have GMO technology. They just bought Syngenta. Um, can we use this abroad uh, while having, um, let's say, GMO-free organic green production at home? You see that in soy. Uh, China has a quite, I think, competitive non-GMO soy production. And the province who produce the most of that do not want GMO at all costs. They're very anti-GMO uh, because they have a market segment uh, for, there's a big market segment for non-GMO soy in tofu in the soy milk and so on. Um, so at the moment the government is thinking should we employ it in China I think they're very pro GMO uh, on a global uh, uh, stage but maybe not in China and it's a very controversial ideological issue still very heated debate a uh, lot of emotions and, and is it too early on that point for, for China for India to be speaking with the Australian government with the departments Louise is that something that 
um, is topical now or are we too far away in, in, in opportunities for Australian producers? Um, China wants to, you know, they, they, they want to, let's say, take the lead. They want to be the best. They want to, you know, they want to produce a top shelf uh, because that's more valuable. Um, if that is in China or abroad, it doesn't necessarily matter in the future. I think that's the trajectory it's going. Um, um, they are absolutely looking for the top shelf. I mean, they looking for cooperation with um, Israel, Holland, uh, and Australia should be more in there, I should say. Um, I, I, you know, we, we, being in China, you see the Dutch and the Israelis are everywhere um, helping, helping China, and they're, as far as I understand, creating a lot of commercial uh, opportunities there. Okay. Do we have any other any questions? Louise, Louise, a question starting with you. Um, what do you think the, the USA administration means for our exports, our exporters? Um, <clears throat> I think it's unclear. Um, and um, over the next 12 months, it might be clearer. Um, I think there are some risks around ensuring that we continue to partner with the US on the global trading environment. Um, but it's not clear yet what um, the USDA and administration will, uh, what sort of deals might be done with other countries and whether there are competitors and what sort of deals are they and whether they're going to be a disadvantage to Australia. So I think for us it's, um, you know, we partner in the, with the US on a lot of activities and obviously we're keen to continue to do that but it's um, unclear and probably um, uh, very um, unwise to predict other than it's it's very it's a very unclear environment, it's a very murky environment at the moment. Okay. And do we oh. uh, Rob Rob Dickey C B H a question uh, for on India. Um, given the reliance on uh, imports the low stocks to use ratio. Um, could you sort of make any comment around India's recent push for a change on phytosanitary measures? Um, and you know, given that they don't align with international phytosanitary measures, any comment on to the background of, of that push? Thanks. Uh, India is an old democratic country and uh, we have two departments which fight with each other. One is the Ministry of Agriculture, which no, never goes in sync with Ministry of Food. The basic objective of Ministry of Agriculture is to give higher realization to farmers, and objective of Ministry of Food is to keep the inflation low. So this year we had a good crop, and that's where Ministry of Agriculture approached food to increase the duty, which never happened. And that's where these are just the threats. To be very honest, India also understand long term we are going to become importer of goods. It is impossible to change the FITO and reappeal later on. So these are just the threats which government of India will keep putting in the market uh, that we are going to change the phytosanitary measures, we are going to change the fumigation thing. But they are not going to do it actually because they know they cannot shut the door forever. You might see changes which may happen on duty, which are more commercial, but I don't think it is going to happen on phyto and fumigation measures, which are more permanent in nature. So these are short-term measures to keep the domestic prices high so that a farmer can have a high realization. And these threats come from Ministry of Agriculture, who can give these threats. Rather, Ministry of Food will stay quiet on this. <laughs> 